much. And um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Gogol. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for UK Equities at Alliance Global Investors. And I'm the manager of the Merchants Trust. And I'm delighted to be here to talk to you today about investing in the UK for income. Um, I was actually going to call my, my presentation something slightly different. I'll just get through the disclaimer. I was going to call it Beware the Fanged Bat. And um, <laughs> for those who don't know, the FANG, the fangs and the bats, are two types of stocks at the moment which are driving the stock market. Uh, FANG stands for Facebook, Am Amazon, Apple, Netflix and Google. And bats are the Asian equivalents, Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent. And these stocks are real giants at the moment in the market. And the reason I say beware of them, there's, there's two reasons as an investor you need to be, be very conscious of and, be, and, and think about these, these, these companies and this bat. The first is these businesses are transforming the world. They are transforming the way we do things, the way we shop, the way we consume media, um, the way we consume financial services. They are all being disrupted or potentially disrupted by the changes going on at some of these big companies and thousands of much smaller companies. The second reason is these are really very big companies and are dominating stock markets in many ways. So if you look on, um, on this slide, you can see the performance of the fangs and the bats over the last two or three years. They've dramatically outperformed the stock markets in the world. In fact, the seven largest companies, according to the FT, um, are all members of the fangs or the bats in the world. So clearly, when we think about investing today, we've got to think, what, what's going on? What do these companies mean? And, and, and is there any value left in that? And where, where can we invest for income? And where can we, where can we invest for uh, where we can get some value? So many markets have been pushed up to quite high levels, partly because of uh, cheap money. And that's true, particularly if you look at American equities. If you look at the fangs and the bats, they're at very high levels. But even if you look at the UK stock market, uh, the price earnings ratio on the stock market in the UK is pretty high. It's about 20 times. It's, it's higher than for most of its history. Even if you look at other measures, price to book value, maybe it's not quite extreme, but the, av the level overall on the stock market is, is pretty high. And if you look at bonds, government bonds or cash, the yields you can get, as you know, on, on those assets are very low. So the question really is, where can people invest? How can, I make, how can I invest and make a good return? And by investing, we mean thinking about the returns you're likely to get from buying an asset not just speculating the price might go up, not just buying Bitcoin because you think it's going to go up tomorrow. And I have no view on Bitcoin, I should say. But investing is about trying to think what the cash flows of the asset you're buying are going to deliver in the medium to long term. Well, there is some hope. There is some good news. This is a chart produced by Exan BMP, one of the um, research house. And they say that actually there's a record number of companies at the moment in the UK on, on about 20 times earnings or more, so really highly rated, the equivalent of the bats and the fangs, the growth stocks on very high valuations. There's a lot of those. Now, normally, when there are a lot of those companies, there's very little value in the market. But the funny thing about today is there's actually quite a few companies on price earnings ratio below 10. In fact, there's more than an average number of companies on a very low valuation. You're seeing a quite extreme polarization in the market between the companies that people want to buy, which are high growth or, or solid growth, very dependable earners, and those where there's an issue. It might be the issue might be what's happening in the UK with Brexit. Uh, it might be what's happening in, in the retail sector where you're getting disruption from online trading. There are quite a lot of companies, and we own quite, some, some of them I can talk about later, where the valuations are really pretty modest. So there are opportunities out there. We think the solution to this question, where can I invest, is, well, I think you've got to be active. You've got to actually try and seek out those companies which offer good value and try and avoid the ones that don't. I, I think, um, I think passive, you know, I can understand totally why people might track an index, but there is no such thing as passive investing. You have to choose an index at the very least. Even if you pick the all-share index, you are making an active decision to choose an index. Now, Bernstein Research are saying that there's actually more indices in the world today <laughs> then there are large companies. And it's not just the S&P index or the FTSE all share, or the FT all share index. There's sub-indices. People, you can have an index or an ETF that tracks individual sectors, that tracks high growth companies, low volatility companies. You can probably almost certainly buy low volatility, high growth pharmaceutical stocks in America if you want as an index. There's probably an index for that. And the problem with these indices is they're crowding into certain areas. 
A lot of people are buying the low volatility, high growth indices, and are buying the same stocks that I was showing you earlier, the FANG stocks, the Amazons, the Netflix, the Googles. They're all trading at high levels. They're being bought by a number of these indices, and the share prices have been pushed to quite high levels, and that's leaving a lot of other areas neglected. We think there is a huge number of opportunities today, despite the fact the markets are near record highs. There's a lot of opportunities in the UK today. I just thought I'd go back to basics a little bit about, about returns, about income, about, about where, you, where you get your money when you invest in the market. This, this study looks at many different countries around the world and the return, total return you get over a very long period, from 1970 to the end of 2015. And typically you get around about a 5% uh, total return from most of these markets. The bulk of the return comes from either the dividend you got when you bought, i.e. the initial yield on the portfolio and the dividend growth. Now, you can say the dividend growth is the capital growth because as the dividend grows, the value of the shares grow. But essentially, what you're getting over the very long term is the, value, the yield you start with and the growth in those dividends. So every now and then, you get a market that's derated a lot over 40 years or re-rated, the grey areas. But over a very long period of time, those re-ratings and deratings of the market even themselves out. So what you're left with is the yield you start with and the income you get, the growth you get on top of that. So it's really important to focus on income. Um, and I mean, Toby said, I'm very thankful for Toby. He said, he said a lot of the groundwork for investment trusts and, and what we do, and Merchants Trust has a lot of very similar characteristics in terms of an independent board, the ability to use gearing, various other structures. But we take quite a different attitude on, on income and, and total returns. The chart here on the left, sorry, it's a bit complicated, and I'll come over this side maybe. <coughs> It talks about the very long term, from 1900 to 20, 2010. If you put a pound in the stock market in 1900 and bought the top 100 companies in the UK, your pound would have grown to 20,000 pounds if you reinvest your dividends every year, over 111 years. If you bought the highest 50 yielding shares each year, and then at the end of the year you bought the highest 50 yielding the next year, your pound would have grown to 93,000 pounds. You would have outperformed the market by 1.5% per annum, compound, over 111 years. Now, that is, that's remarkable in a number of ways. Firstly, it's, it's quite strange that companies that pay you out the most today, the highest income, give you the best total return. That's slightly counterintuitive. You might think companies that put money away in, aside to invest give you a better return, but historically they haven't. The second thing, this tells you nothing about companies whether they may cut the dividend or not. Within this list, there'll be a, very, a large number of companies that had really high dividend yields, which may have cut the dividend. But actually, even when a company cuts the dividend, the total return you get can be very good, because often, by the time they get to cut the dividend, the shares are extremely lowly priced, and you can make a good capital return. So you don't, as an investor, you don't necessarily have to avoid dividend cuts or companies that might cut the dividend. You have to look for value. So what do we do in Merchants Trust? Well, we, we try and come target companies that yield at least as much as the market, if not more. But, and this is really important, the yield alone is never the reason, a sufficient reason, in fact it's never the reason for buying a share. We're always looking at the total return we can get from a company. We're always looking for companies which we think are cheap and good value and where we can make a good return. And equally, we don't, I think that says what I think it says, yep, we don't automatically sell a share if the yield drops below the market. So that might be because the share price has gone up a lot and the, and the, share, and the yield has dropped. Sometimes it's because the company's cut the dividend. But if there was sufficient value in there in the first place, if we did our analysis right, then the occasional dividend cut is not necessarily a problem. You can still potentially make money. I'll then talk about, a little bit about Merchants Trust itself. And, and as I said, Toby has set a lot of groundwork, which is, which is great. So I don't have to talk about the investment trust structure. But we are a genuine high-yield UK equity fund. And I'll stress, I'll stress the UK here because we are very different to the fund you've just been hearing about because we're 100% invested in the UK. Now, I can totally understand why people want to have exposure to companies and markets around the world, and I would never tell an investor they should be fully, fully invested in the UK. But I think the UK is a pretty good place to invest. Firstly, the UK has one of the best legal systems, probably the best protection for minority rights for shareholders with the takeover panel and, and so on. Um, and also, the UK market is very global, very international. Many companies traded in the UK earn their, the majority of profits and sales abroad. So 
you can invest through a company like Merchants Trust in the UK stock market, get exposure to businesses and industries around the world, but with the UK takeover protection, with the UK legal <coughs> system behind you. I think that's a pretty powerful combination, but I would never say that that's all that an investor should do with their money. We have grown the dividend every year for 35 years. I'll show you that in a minute. We're very active and high conviction. And when I say very active, I don't mean that we're always buying and selling things every day. But we do take quite strong views, and we do move them. We don't have a buy and hold policy. If a share gets expensive, we will sell it. We have a good performance record. We're backed by very significant investment resources, a bit like Bailey Gifford. And we've got, the trust has an experienced and independent board and a very modest management fee. So to talk through my investment process, I'll give you one example. And we, we essentially look for three things when we buy a company. Uh, we ask three questions. How, how good a business is it? How cheap a business is it? And what's going to change? And Bovis, UK house builder, we didn't own any house builders earlier this year. But Bovis is a fairly typical UK house builder. They make about 3,500 homes a year. They've got a four-year land bank. Most of the homes they make are in the southeast, outside of London. And they've got net cash on the balance sheet. The problem is they tried to expand too quickly. They tried to produce 4,000 homes a year. They ran into all sorts of problems with the quality of supply and the ability to deliver those homes. They ended up having two very big profit warnings and having to reset expectations. So although it's fundamentally a sound business, it got into trouble. It became very cheap. It was, um, this, this chart is a bit complicated, I'm afraid, but on the bottom we're showing, we're showing the price to tangible net asset value, how much you pay for every pound of assets. And with the house builders, essentially the assets are the land bank and buildings they're currently making. Bovis was by far the cheapest back in the summer. It was trading just above the book value of the assets. In fact, at one point, it was below that. And that reflected the fact that the return on capital, ROACE, was low, was depressed because of these profit warnings they'd had. The idea here, though, is that if they can improve the returns, if they can improve the profitability, sort the business out, the returns can go up and the share price will move up along this line. And that's starting to happen. The, the, the share price has started to move along that line. The shares looked very cheap in the summer, and we were encouraged when two other house builders tried to buy the company. That put, some, put a pretty clear value on the assets. And the third thing we ask is what's going to change. We're very conscious of the theme about the disruptive threats to industries and the opportunities, structural change, cyclical changes. House building is in a pretty, oh, sorry. House building is in a pretty good place at the moment with a lot of demand for housing. Uh, there's a recovery coming through here. There are some risks. It is a cyclical industry. The economy is pretty strong. The house prices are pretty high. There are some cyclical issues here. But generally, we think Bovis is a pretty good example of a company we like to buy. Sound business, cheap, cheap for a good reason, and the opportunity to turn itself around. Moving on to Merchants Trust dividend record. We've grown the dividend every year for 35 years. We have a dividend yield of 5.1%. We are one of the highest yielders in our sector. And we use, as Toby was talking about earlier, we use the dividend reserves. The directors in, in certain periods could put money away into reserves, like 2008, 2009. Sorry, yeah, 2008, 2009, 2010. The directors, 2009 rather, were able to put money away into reserves when the earnings were above the dividend. And that, that tied over for a rainy day when they could, the directors could draw on those reserves and continue to grow the dividend every year coming out of the financial crisis. We're now in a situation where the dividend has been broadly covered by the earnings for the last two or three years. And in fact, the directors have raised the dividend at the interim stage at a slightly higher rate. Now, I said we are active investors. This chart, I won't, I won't <coughs> talk about the detail, but essentially shows the five new companies we, we added to the portfolio in the first half of the year out of 45 names and the five that we sold and the reasons for them. We were principally, we're buying recovery situations where the market doesn't see the opportunity we can see in a company and is, and is companies lowly priced because of that, or companies like National Express or WPP, which we just think are undervalued. And we've been selling companies which are generally where they're fully valued, like Carnival, which has been a great performer in the last three or four years, and we now see less opportunity going forwards. Some of the themes in the portfolio... Um, this is where I suppose some similarity with the, with the last speaker. We are, we are looking for company, companies that can benefit from what's happening in, in the world out there. So we do like earnings growth. If we can buy companies that can grow structurally at a sensible price, and we can buy them at a central, sensible price, that's great. If we can get exposure to emerging markets where we think the consumers will spend more money and grow and become wealthier over time, like the Prudential again, if we can buy that at a sensible price, that's great. 
Where we are very different, I guess, is we do like a few of these very big mega caps. We do like Shell and BP. And yes, Shell and BP aren't going to grow their dividends in the short term. But two years ago, Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, had a dividend yield of 8%. Today, it's under 6 And when you move from a dividend yield of 8% to under 6 with a static dividend, your share price has gone up 33%. To us, that's a pretty attractive return on top of the 6% dividend that we're getting. It was actually 8 so there are often times when a high starting yield can be an indicator of genuine value. We won't necessarily hold that share forever, but at the moment we still, we still like it. And we've been confident, and it's interesting to see that Royal Dutch Shell and BP are starting to generate more cash today when oil is at $55, $60 a barrel than they were generating when the oil was, price was over $100 because the cost of doing business has come down. The amount they're having to spend on investment has come down so dramatically they're actually generating high levels of cash now. And going forward, they should be able to cover all the costs of the business, the capital investment cost, the cost of the interest cost on their debt, and the cost of the dividend fully from their cash flow. And in fact, Royal Dutch Shell only last month significantly raised the free cash flow target they think they can deliver from their business over the next few years. So we do like a few of the mega caps, but certainly not all of them. Other themes, if we can, a lot of the portfolio today is in recovery situations and turnaround situations where businesses have, are going through a more difficult time and the stock market is putting a really low valuation on them, but where there is significant value in the medium to long term. And also, digitalization. If we can find beneficiaries of digitalization, companies that can grow because of the internet and use that, that's a great thing. So IG Group, the whole business model is based on people uh, trading financial assets through, through using, um, using mobile phones, using um, web, you know, uh, their computers and so on. Uh, Labrooks, you'll see down here, we put this slide together before last week's bid for Labrooks. Um, but that's another company where the digital gaming area, the digital gambling activities are growing pretty fast. And that's attracted the interest of a foreign buyer in the last couple of weeks. So that gives you a feel for some of the themes in the portfolio. Um, last couple of slides. In terms of the overall portfolio, I should stress that when we build a portfolio, we, um, we, don't, we don't think about where the index is and position ourselves around it. We're trying to buy cheap companies uh, in, in, in attractive industries. But clearly, investors often want to know how we are positioned against the index. Uh, so for example, the biggest sector we have compared to the index is financial services. We're not saying we particularly like the financial services industry, but just there's a number of companies in that sector which we think are really attractive, really interesting. Equally, we don't, we don't own any tobacco companies. We are concerned about the rise of e-cigarettes, the rise of new, new next-generation technologies, which are disrupting the cigarette industry in a way that it hasn't been disrupted for decades, if not centuries. Um, and cigarettes are one of the most profitable businesses, products in the world, because you can't advertise them. So if there's a new product coming through which is disrupting that, you need to understand the risks there. Um, individual companies, if we don't have a positive view on a company, we simply won't own it. And if we do have a positive view, we want to make sure we have enough of that company to make a difference to the portfolio. A couple of other themes, just very quickly. Aerospace and defense and construction are, are two industries which have been through a long, difficult down cycle and are probably starting to see a recovery in construction spending and defense spending around the world, which should put those industries in a good position. And we can find interesting companies to own in those sectors. So just to round off, sorry to run through very quickly, but, but Merchants Trust, we are a genuine high income equity fund, a high yield equity fund. We have grown the dividend every year for 35 years, and that's a key objective of the directors. We are active, by which I mean not just we take big views, but we do and we will move that portfolio around. We are very value driven, so we will sell shares when they get expensive, however much we like the company. And we have a good performance record. Uh, we are backed by significant resource. We have a very experienced t board. I haven't talked about them today, but the board typically is roughly half investment professionals by training and half commercial or industrial people by training or by background. And we have a very modest management fee. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon.